morning and welcome to Fifth Street Baptist Church where Reverend Dr. Joshua Dreyer is our pastor and this is our Sunday School Hour with our senior adult class. My name is Vaughn Summers and I'll be your facilitator for this session. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we praise you, we thank you, and we adore you, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we might be doers of, the, of your word and obedience. We humble ourselves before you, and we give, give thanks to you, Lord, for sustaining us through this pandemic. We pray for those who are on the front lines, our doctors and nurses, our grocery workers and our truck drivers, and all of those who are behind the scenes but are essential uh, to, the, to the, our economy. We pray for our president and our government for unity. And we thank you, Lord, for the, for the opportunity to study your word together. We pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us of our sins, that we might be able to hear and understand and obey what you have to say for us today. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, when have you really enjoyed being a part of a group? I know you missed that. Uh, this disease has come between us even as individuals and as groups. Uh, we have an illustration in our study guide. For those of you who have the, this study guide, uh, it's on page number 110. There's a picture with showing a group of people with sparklers in a nighttime setting. They seem to be really enjoying themselves. Uh, on page number 111, however, there's an illustration that talks about this, uh, about being together and exercising our bodies, uh, like people work out a lot to get in shape. Well, these it, 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 this talks about uh, exercising consistently all year round, people who do that. Do you know anybody like that? Well, there are many people who exercise uh, all year round to try to keep themselves in tip-top shape uh, as much as they can. And I know it's hard to stay motivated to do something like that, but they do. And how, how are they motivated? Well, they, they feed off of each other. Uh, they go together in, in groups or in twos, or, uh, and they, they encourage one another uh, to prevent those who... who uh, uh, to prevent being tempted to give up their exercise program because they just get bored or they just get tired or they just can't, they just can't do it anymore. So they encourage each other. Now when we pray, it's basically the same, same thing. When we pray for each other, we are actually encouraging each other uh, by asking God to strengthen us uh, and the ones we pray for uh, through the struggles that we're going through in life. Now, since we are joined together, and that was the title of uh, uh, our last week's lesson, we are joined together by Jesus Christ in his body, uh, we pray for each other. A and we do this, uh, which brings us to the point of this lesson, we pray for each other. Uh, the church is strengthened as we pray. The church is strengthened. As we pray is the point of this lesson. We pray for each other, pray for one another. So, let's ask the Lord's blessing on this, 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 this His word, and that, and then we'll move forward. Father, once again, we come to you, praising you and thanking you, that we can uh, come boldly before your throne and ask you to bless your word in our hearts, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our inner person that we may be convicted of our, our sins against you, that we may humble ourselves before you, that we may be uh, commit to you personally to obey your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture text is taken from the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, cha uh, chapter 3. We looked at chapters 1 and 2 last week. Today, we'll go with chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 21. 14 through 21. I'll read the text 
from the scriptures. I'll be reading from the NASB. And then after that, we'll break these down into different sections, uh, starting with chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. So the scripture text is taken from, again, if you have your Bibles or devices, turn now with me to Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse number 14. I'll be reading, as I said, from the NASB. Also, it says, too, that, that for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in, within us, to him be the glory in, in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And now we go to our setting, the text that is listed for us to focus on. And we are focusing on today Paul's prayer under these conditions, under certain conditions. Now, the scriptures that up to this point, Paul was a prayer. He was, uh, as we might call it, a prayer warrior. He prayed about everything all the time. He prayed for the, for the churches he established, uh, taken from Ephesians 1, 16 and Philippians 1 and 4. He also encouraged others, other Christians to pray for, for him uh, and, other, and other needs in their areas, Philippians 4 and 6. He urged them to pray regularly, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. One of his most famous prayers is his request for divine deliverance from the thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. God did not remove the thorn in the flesh. But Paul learned to rely on God's power in his struggle with this situation. Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, starting in verse number 14. We'll be looking at this uh, small section here, 14 through 17. He says in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, going back to verse 14, he says, for this, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now Paul often prayed for the for the uh, for the churches he had established uh, on his missionary journeys. He established a church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. Whether he prayed for the church at Galatia, Galatians 1, 3 through 5. He prayed for the church at Philippi, Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and the church of Colossae. Chapter 1 of Colossi, of Colossians, rather, verses 9 through 12. And now he's praying now for the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 1, 14 through 21. As I read and I studied, he says, again, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Now, if I were to start reading this text from verse 14, I would be curious about the reason Paul was talking about. I would want to know what reason he's talking about that he's praying for the church. 
And even though it would not be uncommon to find the Apostle Paul in any posture of prayer and humble and humble before his God, Paul gives us the reason as he reveals it to the Christians at Ephesus. Paul tells them that he is a, first of all, that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ for them. Now we'll be looking at, if you can go back to chapter 3 and verse 1. We'll just, we'll just go from uh, verse 1 through verse 13 to find out this reason. And then we'll come back to our text, our major text, context text, uh, in verse 14. Paul tells them that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ for them, for the sake of the you Gentiles, he says in, in, in chapter 3, verse 1. Paul is a prisoner of Rome. Remember, Paul was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Now, Paul, whose name was Saul, was, was one who had persecuted the church until he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Paul was also sent out by the Holy Spirit on his missionary journeys, uh, along with, with uh, Barnabas, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Now, in every place Paul went on his missionary journeys, he always would go to the Jewish synagogues first to preach Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, some would accept uh, his, his teachings, but most would regret and oppose him. Acts chapter 14. Now the Jews arrested Paul uh, for preaching Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and he was brought before the Jewish council. Acts chapter 21, verses 27 through 40. Also Acts chapter 23. There was a conspiracy to kill Paul while he was in the Jewish custody. Get rid of him. Since he was a Roman citizen, however, he was moved to a safer location by the Roman soldiers. Acts chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. While at this location, Paul went before three high-ranking Jewish officials in, ex in, in explaining why he was preaching Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the inception of of the Gentiles into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ the Messiah by the gospel. Now the Jewish people, when he started preaching this, they were just frantic. They were just angry. They wanted to get rid of him. They, they said it, this was blasphemy. They were highly opposed. They felt that they were the only people that belonged to God. Everybody else were, 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 were Gentiles, were dogs. However, during Paul's last hearing before King Agrippa, it was determined that Paul had not done anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Uh, it was, uh, and King Agrippa said in, in himself, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Acts chapter 26, verse 32. Well, Paul did appeal to Caesar. And so they sent him to see. They sent him to Rome, uh, where he is held prisoner, awaiting his hearing before Caesar. And from here, from Rome, is where he writes the book of Ephesians. Now I'm going to refer you to hold your finger in chapter three, and look back at chapter two, and a few verses from that section there. Paul said, if indeed, this is also in, in line with the reason, he said, Paul said, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship, if you're reading from the uh, King James Version, it uses the word dispensation, uh, the stewardship or dispensation of God's grace, which was given to me uh, for you. The word dispensation is a period of time during which God deals with, a, in a particular way, with man in respect to sin, uh, 
and man's responsibility to that sin. The word dispensation means administration. It's first found in 1 Corinthians 9 and 17. Now in the NASB, it uses the word stewardship, and that means a careful and responsible management of something uh, cons uh, entrusted to one's care. Paul had been given something, uh, something very, very important, uh, or, and it, was, it, it had been entrusted, so uh, the writers of, uh, the interpreters of the NSB uses the word uh, stewardship. Now, that by revelation uh, there was made known to me uh, the mystery, as I wrote in brief. Now, this word mystery uh, uh, is something that has not been revealed in the past, but now it's been revealed. So, in verse number 4 of uh, chapter 3, going back to chapter 3 now, it says, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Uh I'll make a little correction here. Uh, I read just just now chapter uh, verse three of chapter three, and now I'm reading chapter verse four of chapter three again. So, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of of Christ. Verse five of chapter three, book of Ephesians which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was, in verse 7, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, he says, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Now, Paul says he is bowing the knee before the Father in addition to the, to the eyes of his heart as he listed in 118, chapter 1, verse 18, in humility, in light of what God has told him and empowered him to do. That's what he did. So, how would you feel if you were given the same responsible task that Paul was given? Well, guess what? We now have that same responsibility too. Because he says in verse 10, he says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. Now, no one, no one in all eternity knew what was going on, what God's plan was. God revealed his plan for the redemption of the human race to the prophets. But no one until now, not even in heaven or earth, knew about this mystery. But the apostles and the prophets, the apostles and the prophets, you had all of the prophets when they went into different situations. For instance, Isaiah uh, talks about the birth of the Messiah, talks about the, the, the cross, the birth of the Messiah uh, in chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah. Uh, the cross, the, the ser suffering servant in chapter 53. But he didn't know what he was talking about. He was repeating what God told him. 
he had no idea what was going on. Now the mystery now has been revealed to everyone, even the rulers and the authorities, which are angels in heaven, in heavenly places, were standing in awe at what, what had been revealed to the Apostle Paul and is now had been revealed to the church. Now everyone knows that by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought together or brought near by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2 and 13. Going back to 2 again, we find that this, verse 14, Ephesians 2, 14. He says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, that is, both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one, and, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Verse 15, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he, may, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse, chapter 2, verse 16. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. That's the reason. He's praying for the church at Ephesus. That's the reason. So, going back to verse chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians, and verse number 11. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12 in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Verse 13, Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are your glory. Now, this was God's plan. This was God's plan from the beginning. God carried out... The, out his plan through Jesus Christ. And this is why we can have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Paul tells his brothers and sisters not to lose heart because of how they see his, or his immediate circumstances. Well, they're seeing him this way. Well, he was preaching the gospel. He got arrested. Now he's in prison. Oh, uh, he might be going. He might be going away for good. What good is this? He says, all of this was part of God's plan, and we should not lose. Don't lose heart because of this. Don't stop. Don't give up because of this. He said, and we should not. Uh, uh, and even as we read about Paul's circumstances, or even as we go through similar circumstances ourselves. As Paul told, told the church at Corinth, he said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, he said, My beloved brother, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your, 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 your toil in, is not in vain in the Lord. Now, since we have the same task, the responsibility, the same stewardship as Paul had, how should we respond? Don't you think we need prayer? Or can we carry this out by our own plan? So let's follow up the example God gives Paul as he prays for the church uh, of Eph Ephesus. And this brings us to back to verse 14 when we start. This is why Paul said, I bow the knee before the Father. Paul kneels before the Father. This is awesome. This is mind-blowing. 
Paul bows the knee before the Father. The typical Jewish man stood while praying. Sometimes uh, a Jew would kneel. Well, Solomon kneeled in 1 Kings 8.54. Daniel kneeled in Daniel 6.10. Even Jesus kneeled in Luke 22.41. He says, He bowed the knee from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. Verse 15. Paul addresses God as Father. Paul prayed to God the Father. Jesus addressed God with the Aramaic word Abba, Father, pointing to an intimate personal relationship to God in Mark 14.36. Paul and other Christians adopted this way of addressing God as the Father. Now Paul humbled Paul humble's posture in prayer also matched the humble posture of his of, of, of his heart in his reverence for God. No matter what the posture of our body is in the most important posture is the posture of our hearts. So in verse number 16 he says this that he would grant you now he makes the request that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Paul moved into the heart of his prayer for the church of Ephesus. What did Paul pray about? Paul's prayer is, dress, is addressed to God. Throughout Paul's letters, Paul mentioned many prayer concerns, some to individuals, some to the congregations. He ca you can categorize these prayers that Paul uh, prayed for the churches. The writers of our study material uh, helps us with an, with an, an acrostic from the word ACTS, A-C-T-S, and if you want to take a uh, piece of paper and a pencil and write this down. Uh, you can. You may already know it. Uh, Acts, instead of writing Acts as we normally do from left to right uh, horizontally, the acrostic Acts, we'll write it vertically. A, below that C, and below the C, T, and below the, the T, S, Acts. And I'll go on back to A. A is Adoration or praise, that's a type of category of prayer. C is confession of sins, uh, another category of types of prayer. T is thanksgiving, and S is for supplication, prayer in which we ask God uh, to do something for us or for someone else. In the prayer that we're talking about now, this is an intercessory prayer in which Paul is praying for someone else. It is also prim primarily uh, a prayer of supplication. Paul is asking God to do something for someone else. Now we can we can use the, these prayers to expand our own way of praying. Uh, notice on page 112 of your study text, praying for others, not just ourselves, we should we should definitely pray for our fellow believers. On page 113 uh, of our study, te uh, study books, uh, it says pray for spiritual needs, not just physical needs. Pray that as, as children of God, we would shed sinful works of the flesh and grow in the holy fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 through 23. Also, pray that God's people, uh, we would love one another and bear with one another and forgive one another and serve one another. Also listed, that's also listed in Colossians 3, 12 and 13. And then pray as God's ambassadors that we would serve the world and share God's word in the midst of persecution. Pray that we would 
even turn the other cheek and persevere to the end, as listed in 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. So Paul prays to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Again, on Paul, page 112, uh, look in that section, you see a section called Key Words, and it talks about the inner man. Here Paul used this phrase to refer to human abilities or faculties such as conscience or the will. God considers a person's heart, not their appearance, as 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells us. Now, Paul was always concerned about young Christians becoming more mature in their walk with Christ. He wanted them to tap into the power of the Trinity. If they did, they would not face life's obstacles alone. God would strengthen them. As, they, as the body of Christ, they could encourage each other also. Paul assured the Ephesian Christians, as well as, as us, that we all can be strengthened with power, all of us. When we feel weak, we should recall the power of God as a steady help. Some Christians speculate about the God's omnipotence. God's power is a resource for the Christian life. Paul had to rely on the power of God when he prayed to God to remove the thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. Paul affirms the riches of his glory. This means it refers to God's majesty and radiance, 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. Paul prayed that God would strengthen each believer in his or her inner being. Now Paul was concerned for the person's whole person, spiritual as well, as physical. Paul used the term inner being to show this concern for the whole person. Paul said all this was going to be done by God's Spirit. Now remember God's Spirit energized the church, the early church, on the day of Pentecost and that we should seek to walk by and show the fruit of the Spirit every day, all day, from Acts chapter 2, and then Galatians 5, 16, and verses 22 through 26. So when have you experienced something that was obviously an answer to prayer? Now, many of you can, uh, if not all of us, have experienced something that was, that was obviously an answer to prayer. So how can prayer help us? experience the power and presence of Christ. Personally, I would say, pray. And as you pray, and you and I pray, believing, we'll see for ourselves how this can happen. So next we will focus on God's love. As we continue to study the Bible, our scripture from this section is taken from, uh, again, from chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, Ephesians 17 through 19. Verse 17 says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Verse 19 says, And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now let's comment on, ver on the verses here. In verse 17 it says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, I'd like to focus our attention to the word dwell, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The word dwell in this context, uh, he wants us to understand that the word dwell is to be totally at home where it is that we're dwelling in. You come into your house, this is your house, this is where you pay the rent, 
this is where you have everything with the way you want it and and uh, you are free to roam in every nook and cranny of that dwelling place and then you invite a friend over and you give that friend the same access that you have that friend is not restricted from going through the drawers of the, of the cabinets or the, or the cupboards or uh, any of the closets they are free to do whatever they want to do this is the context in which uh, uh, Paul is using the word dwell uh, in this scripture here he says so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith we're not holding anything back from Christ as he looks around in our hearts under the under the different areas in uh, in small uh, enclosed areas he may find uh, this sin or that sin or that way we're thinking anything that's holding back from 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 him is considered uh, sin in, in in God's perspective so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. Love is the basis for the uh, in Christianity. If there is no love, there is no Christianity from either me or you or anybody else. Now look on page 116 of your, of your study guides and it will show us how we should pray that the members of our church would have a deeper sense of God's love in our lives. Page 116 shows us that. First it says we should pray that we would constantly remember that it was God's love that saved us and it is God's love that sustains us. That's how we should pray. You can't help but say thank you. It wasn't, we had nothing to do with that. And then we should pray that we would grow in understanding the full measure of God's love and character. That we would be astounded by the sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross. This is mind-blowing to us. Once again, Paul uses the word agape to describe God's love that is expressed to us through Jesus Christ. So in verse number 18, he writes, may be, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Can we understand how much God loves us? I know I can. Other than what's written here in, in, in what's expressed to me personally, John 3.16 captures God's love for the world. And the love was God's motive for providing salvation for a lost world. God demonstrated, it tells us, his love even while we were sinning against him, Romans 5 and 8. We cannot comprehend with our, with our minds how much God loves us and what God's love is all about. Totally can't, totally without, without, without doing that. We find, too, that God's love draws believers into his family. In love, he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. The love of God is crucial to a believer's assurance and security, Romans 8, 31, and 39. So how does knowing that you are loved by God give you and I confidence and assurance. Look at verse number 19. 
He says, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be full, filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, our knowledge of the love of Christ cannot surpass the total knowledge of the love of Christ, if I might put it that way. But experiencing, I'm finding this, that experiencing that which is shown to us, to me, will make us complete in Jesus Christ. As we allow God's revelation, the word, to penetrate our hearts, and we realize how much God loves us. In that much, for Colossians 2 and 9 and 10 tells us this, For to him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Now knowing that I am complete in Jesus Christ, I have confidence and assurance that I am an intimate part of God's family. The fullness of God assures us that strong, maturing Christians can have a long-term relationship with God. Now, and that we have a strong sense of God's presence and guidance in our daily lives. Now, that's, these, this is what Paul requested for the Ephesian church. Can God do what Paul requested? Next, we will be reminded of God's ability to do more than we can imagine. Let's continue to study the Bible from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 tells us this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly above, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now Paul finished his prayer with, a climac with, with climactic words of worship to God. These words demand our attention. In your, in your study guide on page number seven, 117, two important principles are mentioned here. God is able to do more than we ask. This truth should give us enormous confidence as we pray for one another. And then, our confidence is not based on the greatness of our prayers, but on the greatness of of the one to whom we pray, based on what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. I am confident that he can do what Paul asked and what I ask. Now in contrast to the power and greatness of God, we tend to, we, we tend to, pl to pray smaller uh, more limited prayers. Uh, we often fail to realize that all our best solutions uh, are, are pale in comparison to the power and ability of God. He is able to go above and beyond what we ask or think. Now Paul's main point was that this Divine power is available to empower us as Christians. God uses similar uh, endings in, in other scriptures. Note what it says in Jude, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his, glo of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So, when has God exceeded your expectations? With me, as I look back over my life. <laughs> 
at every juncture, at every step, I can see his hand in it, in it from birth up until now and even beyond. If I can do that from then, I can do that from now to, to the end. He has exceeded all my expectations. So now look on page number 18 of your study guide. And we look at the definition of glory here. The definition of glory. The glory of God. That is God's fame or renown. Now we who are Christ's church are to make God famous through our collective witnessing and our collective worship. God's glory is a consistent theme throughout the Bible. It says that God protects his glory in Exodus 23 through 6. God created us for his glory in Isaiah 43 and 7. God does not share his glory, Isaiah 48 and 11. And God saves us for his glory, Ephesians 1 and 12. We are to bring God glory in everything we do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So, what are some specific ways we can pray for the, for the church? Let's live it out as we close out this session. We can admit, or we can adjust our prayers to allow, align more with God, with the spiritual priorities of God as we consider the following. It says in your book on page 119, first of all, you could, we could confess Confess to God the ways we pray in self-centered ways. We can also pray. We can keep a journal of our prayer requests. We do that at, 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 at the church at 5th Street. And then we can pray together. Uh, we can either uh, pray together at a Wednesday night Bible study, or we can call each other and pray together that way. Or we can pray together using the devices of technology that we have. Or we can go in our closets and, and believe it or not, we can pray uh, by ourselves with each other for a specific thing to God. And God will hear it, all of us together. We can pray together in Christ's church, praying with uh, uh, each other. So the point of session two is lesson. The church is strengthened as we pray. The church is strengthened as we pray. So be encouraged, church. We have the power of God to do more in our lives and in the church than we could ever imagine. Let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this session. We thank you and praise you that you can do exceedingly above and, and uh, exceedingly above and beyond whatever we ask or think we thank you lord for your love help us to pray expecting you to do awesome things this week even today for it's in jesus name we pray amen